What I tried to do for this presentation is to look in the last two years and focus my attention on hypertension papers that have been published in the leading journals, New England Journal, Lancet, JAMA, JAK, Circulation, leading cardiovascular journals, and show you that there is a fair amount of controversy over this whole area of what level do you want to go to. I don't have any uh, conflicts related to this. So in Jack, um, recently, um, there was a focus seminar on blood pressure. And um, if you have not read this paper, I would strongly encourage you to. Um, this is uh, a nice summary of prevention and control of hypertension. Now, in this review paper by Sandra Taylor, she um, um, drew this diagram, this figure, in something that we all know but sometimes lose sight of, that primary hypertension, there's a genetic predisposition. There are a lot of lifestyle changes like high-sodium diet, weight gain, excess alcohol, Medications, particularly the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and now that everybody has ADD, the uh, stimulants, and various secondary causes, which I'm not going to talk about, but the most common secondary causes are chronic kidney disease, renal vascular hypertension, and primary aldosteronism. You can see that um, hypertension is probably the most common cause of stroke and multi-infarct dementia. It's got a whole host of deleterious effects in the heart, which I'm not going to go over, the kidney. And it's also associated with abdominal and thoracic aortic aneurysms, um, atherosclerotic peripheral artery disease, and aortic dissection. So in 2017, on the left part of this slide, is the American Guidelines on Prevention, Detection, and Evaluation of Hypertension. And on the right, are the European guidelines. And they don't say exactly the same thing. There are a whole host of other guidelines out there, primary care, and every guideline says something different. But the American guidelines really set off a debate about how low you should keep the blood pressure. And I'm going to show you the difference between these two and show you what led to the development of this very low recommendation that everyone should have a blood pressure less than 130 over 80 and ideally less than 120 over 80. So here are the European guidelines. Optimal is less than 120 over 80. Uh, normal is 120 to 129, 80 to 84. Then they have a category of high normal and then they call hypertension anything over 140 or 90 and then various grades of hypertension. So if you look at this and you compare it to the American guidelines shown here, normal is a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 and less than 80. Elevated is 120 to 129 and less than 80. I don't think there's a lot of us who think of a blood pressure of 125 as being elevated, but this is what the guidelines now say. And then hypertension, stage one hypertension, is the systolic pressure of 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. And there are good data suggesting that the cardiovascular event rate is markedly increased even with blood pressures of 130 to 139. Now this assumes an average of two or more blood pressure readings taken on two or more occasions. So as... Um, We've done in Jack on a number of guidelines. We do comparison guidelines of the US guidelines versus the European guidelines, and that's what was done in this uh, paper that I'm showing you. We have two uh, individuals from the US who are experts in hypertension and one for Europe, from Europe. And this says that as new trials emerge, the guidelines will be updated. The 2018 ACCHA, European Guideline, interprets similar data with a fundamental difference of two different blood pressure goals. One is less than 130 over 80, 
One is less than 140 over 90. Other differences um, occur in older people. The US guidelines say less than 130 over 80 in older people as well. And this is supported by the SPRINT elderly data, which is a subset of the SPRINT trial that I'll show you. And then the European guidelines have focused on um, patient participation and cooperation, and the American guidelines don't say much about that at all. So there are many more similarities than differences. Um, both guidelines emphasize home blood pressure monitoring. I'll tell you more about that. They both uh, recommend combination medication if you want to lower the blood pressure a fairly large amount. There's more attention to detail on proper blood pressure measurement techniques, and I see all the time blood pressures being monitored improperly. A lot is written about adherence, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Both say that beta blockers should not be the primary drug to treat hypertension. They should be used if there are other indications for beta blockers. And then they both recommend telemonitoring and digital health solutions. There are some differences, as I mentioned. Um, emphasis on the cardiovascular risk assessment through the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk calculator of greater than 10% 10-year risk. Um, the American guidelines focus more on hypertension. They focus more on ethnic and racial groups. They do have a new definition of hypertension, but they do not discuss isolated systolic hypertension. Um, they recommend a similar systolic blood pressure target for all individuals, and there's no mention of environmental or altitude effects, and these things are mentioned in the European guidelines. So, if you just look at a combination here, this is office, gr greater than 130 over 80 is hypertension in the American guidelines. Greater than 140 over 90 is hypertension in the European guidelines. And there's been a lot written, I don't have time to talk about this, but there's been a lot written about nighttime dipping of blood pressure. And if you have a nighttime blood pressure of greater than 110 over 65, you have hypertension and your cardiovascular risk is markedly increased. Those numbers are slightly higher for the European. These are the blood pressure targets we already discussed, and hypertension requiring intervention for anybody above 130 over 80 if you're in the US, 140 over 90 if you're in Europe. Now what about subgroups? In the US, every subgroup has the same recommendations. Whereas there are variations in the elderly and diabetics and those with coronary disease, chronic kidney disease, and post-stroke in the European guidelines. So the American guidelines are the easiest to remember and um, therefore pretty easy to follow. Now both suggest that home blood pressure monitoring is indicated. Um, I don't agree with this twice in the morning and twice in the evening, as I'll tell you in a minute, but we do do a lot of home blood pressure monitoring. Um, restrict beta blockers to those with comorbidities with an indication for beta blockade and follow up with detection of adherence. This is a major problem in hypertension. I, I have no equity in this blood pressure device, um, but this is one I use. This is the iHealth wireless blood pressure device. There are others out there that are just as good. Um, once it syncs with your phone, this will say start. You press the button on the phone and it takes your blood pressure wirelessly. And then it automatically records the blood pressure in your phone without you doing anything. So by clicking on this, you can email your blood pressure readings to your physician or um, and it allows patients to really keep track of their blood pressure in a meaningful way. And I give every patient this home blood pressure monitoring sheet. We suggest eye health, but um, if they purchase an arm cuff from a pharmacy, Omron is another reputable brand. I focus on arm blood pressure cuffs, wrist cuffs, and finger cuffs are not accurate. Um, they download the eye health app. We ask them to take their blood pressure two times a day for the first three weeks so we can see what it's like. And we all ask them to alter the times that they take it so we get a representation of all waking hours. 
And if they work, we ask them to take it once a day at work and once a day at home. We show them the proper technique. They should be seated. They shouldn't put the blood pressure cuff on over clothes. Their arms should be resting at the level of the heart. They should wait a few minutes and take their blood pressure. If it's above these numbers, they sit there for another minute and take it a second time. And then we either see them or they email us the blood pressures in three to four weeks. This way, you know what their blood pressure really is. You can also do a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. So what have these guidelines done to um, the number of people with hypertension? So if you look at this, um, this are the number of U.S. adults with stage 1 hypertension, a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 139, 80 to 89, and or. So overall, about 30% have this. And as we age, the blood pressure goes up, especially the systolic blood pressure, the diastolic blood pressure goes up to about age 55, and then it starts to decline. But you can see here that at age 75, 100% of people are classified as having hypertension according to these guidelines. And uh, those age 65 to 74, 87%. There's no difference in the percentage based on um, ethnicity or race. Now, this is, um, this is a very interesting study. This took individuals, this is from The Lancet, published this year, took individuals aged 40 to 79 from 123 national health examination surveys in 12 high-income countries. There were a total of 526,336 participants in this. So the sample size was pretty large. And I know this looks like a busy slide, but it really isn't. Let's just say that men and women are equal in all of these parameters, which they are for the most part. So they're looking at prevalence based on country, and the prevalence is pretty much between 30 and in Finland, it's 52%. It's 59% in men. Awareness, about three quarters of the people are aware there are some countries like Germany and the U.S. where 86% are aware. There are some, company, some countries like Ireland and Japan where 50 or 60% of the people are aware. There, you can look at the number of patients treated, and the number of patients treated is less than the people who are aware almost consistently in every country. And in the U.S., 86% are aware. 80% are treated, but only 54% are at goal. For a asymptomatic disease that is a major player in cardiovascular events, we don't do very well with keeping patients at their goal blood pressure. 54% in women, 49% in men in the U.S. It's even worse in other countries. In Finland, it's 29% in women, 26% in men, in Japan, it's 29% in women, 24% in men. So this is a treatable disease that for a number of reasons, we have a hard time getting patients at their goal blood pressure. This, um, when blood pressure was defined as uh, greater than 140 over 90, the uh, about 72 million Americans had hypertension. Now that blood pressure is defined as greater than 130 over 80, 103 million Americans have hypertension. But look at this. Despite the fact that there's a change of 31 million people with hypertension, only 4.2 had additional pharmacological therapy added. In other words, there's poor uptake on these guidelines. Now, this was just recently published. Uh, this is 1.3 million adults from the Kaiser Permanente system. And I show this because it really puts into perspective, like, just by changing what the goal is, it changes the number of people with normal blood pressure. Here, with a goal of 140 over 90, 81% of this one point three million people have normal blood pressure. 
Here, with a goal of 130 over 80, only 56% have normal blood pressure. So by lowering the goal, we markedly increase the number of people who are classified as having hypertension. And again, this is an age-based thing using 140 over 9, 140, um, about 28% will have it in the later years. Using 130, close to 50% will have it. So what led to um, the American guidelines um, decreasing this to the degree that they have? Well, this is the SPRINT trial, and there's been a lot of uh, controversy about this trial. It was a well, um, the sample size was large, 9,361 people with a systolic blood pressure of 130 or higher and an increased cardiovascular risk, but no diabetes. So they determined this with the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk score. And they were randomized to a target blood pressure of less than 120 or less than 140. The composite primary outcome was MI, other coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, death from cardiovascular causes. And this is what happened. Those randomized to uh, less than 140, this is what their blood pressure was. It was um, 134. Those randomized to less than 120, their blood pressure was 121. It didn't get to less than 120 on the average. The trial was stopped early at 3.26 years. And the patients who were randomized to more intensive therapy were on one more blood pressure medication compared to those who weren't. And you can see there's a 25% relative risk reduction in the primary composite endpoint. There was um, close to a 40% reduction in death from cardiovascular causes or death from any cause. There's about a 27% reduction. So, this played a large role in the lower recommendations for good blood pressure control, remembering that SPRINT excluded diabetics. Every subgroup responded in the SPRINT trial, as you can see here, age, sex, race, previous cardiovascular disease, there was no difference. So, if you have normal blood pressure, you just follow the patient. If you have elevated blood pressure, meaning 120 to 129, you should start the patient on non-pharmacological therapy. I'll talk about that in a second. If they're 130 to 139 or, or 80 to 89, I'm sorry, um, can we go back three slides, four slides, one more back, okay. Um, you go by atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk factor. If your 10-year risk is greater than 10%, you start them on drugs. If it's not, non-pharmacological therapy. Now, I want to talk to you about two fairly common conditions, white coat hypertension you're all aware of. The blood pressure is high in the office. It's normal at home. You can't just assume the patient has white coat hypertension as every patient tries to make you assume. So when the blood pressure is high in the office, they say, oh, but my blood pressure is normal every other time. You have to do either ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring. If their blood pressure is normal at home, they have white coat hypertension and you follow them. If their blood pressure is abnormal, you um, treat them. But this is often missed. This is called masked hypertension. And this has the highest cardiovascular risk, even more so than sustained hypertension. In this condition, the blood pressure is normal in the office, but it's high at home or with ambulatory blood pressure, and this needs aggressive management. So when they say non-pharmacological um, interventions, this is what they mean. Everyone in this audience knows this. What you might not know is the degree of effect that you get from these parameters. From exercise, you get about an average of minus five millimeters of mercury. The DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, grains, low fat dairy products, reduced content of saturated and total fat, the average reduction in patients who follow this is 11 millimeters of mercury. That's pretty good. Weight loss, five millimeters of mercury, reduction in sodium intake, minus five to six in some people, 
enhanced dietary potassium intake, minus five millimeters of mercury, and then moderating alcohol consumption to less than two drinks a day for men, less than one drink a day for women, about minus four millimeters of mercury. Now the guidelines recommend with a class one level of evidence A recommendation that your first line drug should include a thiazide diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, and an ACE or ARB, one of those four classes of drugs, not a beta blocker, as some of the earlier things. Now why is it so many patients have a hard time controlling their blood pressure? As you can see from this slide, um, it's multifactorial. Some patients don't have health insurance or access to health care. In some patients, the hypertension is not even diagnosed or the blood pressure is measured improperly or masked, masked hypertension is not um, recognized. They may not be educated properly. Uh, the healthcare team hasn't uh, participated in shared decision making. Inadequate lifestyle recommendations and counseling absence of home or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, low patient and or provider awareness of blood pressure target. But this is, in my opinion, uh, the biggest cause, and it's clinician therapeutic inertia. Failure to treat mast hypertension, failure to initiate hypertension treatment when present, and failure to intensify therapy in a treated patient when blood pressure is above goal. Um, these are all methods to assess and improve adherence. And some of these are really not practical for 100 million people, like measuring drug levels in the urine. But I'm not going to go over this table, but basically it involves intensive education by the healthcare provider, providing a drug that you only have to administer once a day with few side effects at the lowest cost, doing home blood pressure monitoring and keeping in touch with the patient about their blood pressure levels, and um, consolidate their refill schedule so all prescribed medications are refilled at a single pharmacy visit. These things will help. Now, this was just published in Jack. This is a great paper for those of you who have not seen it because this really tells us what's happening. Therapeutic inertia in cardiovascular disease. Clinical inertia is defined as the failure to initiate or intensify therapy when treatment goals are not met and is well-recognized barrier to improving patient care. How many times have you seen a patient come in and either their office or home blood pressures are running, let's say 142 over 87 or something like that, and we just continue to follow them. One key um, contributor to th therapeutic inertia is poor guideline implementation and slow integration of new knowledge into practice. However, even when clinicians are aware of the guidelines, there's still considerable resistance to changing previous practice habits. The pervasiveness of this problem in the prevention of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and other areas of medicine cannot be overstated. So um, this paper, um, and this is the last study I'm going to show you, this paper just came out in The Lancet. And while this is somewhat impractical um, in our society, this shows what a comprehensive intervention program can do with blood pressure. This is run by Salim Youssef's group in McMaster. This was called HOPE4. It's a cluster randomized trial. There were 1,371 participants with new or poorly controlled hypertension from 30 communities in Colombia and Malaysia. And they used an intervention which included treatment of cardiovascular disease risk factors by what they call non-physician health workers using um, tablet computer-based simplified management algorithms, counseling programs, free antihypertensive medication and statins, that's never gonna happen, 
but supervised by physicians and supervised by a family member or friend. So the primary outcome was a change in the Framingham risk score in which uh, the intensively treated patients had a marked decrease in their risk score. So let me just show you. Um, so the control group is in dotted lines. This is systolic blood pressure. At the end of one year, those in the intervention group had an 11 millimeter of mercury reduction in their systolic blood pressure. This, this translates into um, a marked decrease in cardiovascular events. LDL cholesterol, at 12 months, the LDL cholesterol went from about 130 to 124 in the control group and 106 in the intervention group. And I don't have this here, but there was a marked reduction in the Framingham risk score. So while this may not be practical for our society, it does show that intensive um, team treatment of cardiovascular risk factors, such as um, what we have um, in our prevention center on 85th Street and things like that, really is an effective way to decrease cardiovascular events. So, the key points are that the 2017 American Guidelines redefines hypertension as a systolic blood pressure 130 or more or a diastolic of 80 or more and recommends lowering to less than this level. The blood pressure target is supported by SPRINT, which shows lower hypertension-associated morbidity and all-cause mortality with a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 than with the target above 140. However, there are greater electrolyte abnormalities, syncope, acute kidney injury in the lower target group, but if the patients are watched carefully, this can be avoided. The initial assessment should look for other cardiovascular conditions, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, but when determining which blood pressure medication you're going to use. Recommend the lifestyle modifications I discussed. We all know how difficult it is to get patients to follow these. The antihypertensive agent should generally be selected from one of four classes, ACE, ARB, calcium channel blocker, usually a dihydropyridine, or thiazide type diuretic like hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone. And if you want to reduce the blood pressure by greater than 20 over 10, start them on a combination pill from the beginning. Thank you very much. Um, the patients with mask hypertension are the most challenging, especially when occasionally they do syncopize when they're optimally controlled at home. How do you suggest we should approach those patients? Well, you're absolutely correct. Um, first of all, it's challenging to even make that diagnosis because what's going to make you have the patient take their blood pressure at home when it's completely normal in the office? And I would say if they have a completely normal blood pressure and their cardiovascular risk profile is not um, really severe, that would be the patient I would have do either a 24-hour ambulatory or home. Fortunately, this only makes up a small portion of the 103 million people with hypertension. And I mean, the recommendations are that you treat according to their home blood pressure. So I start slowly and I have them constantly measuring their blood pressure as per the uh, instruction sheet I give and adjust my medications like that. But it, it's pretty infrequent that you encounter that. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, how do you um, reconcile the recommendations about sodium restriction with the findings from Salim Youssef's terrific paper of about six or seven years ago showing a U-shaped mortality and event rate um, with uh, sodium restriction? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, th that's a, a great question. And... Um, 
And not only that, but there are studies that show that really only about 50% of people are salt sensitive and therefore sodium restriction won't do any good in those that are not salt sensitive. I think most African Americans are salt sensitive. They have low renin hypertension. Um, but there are emerging data that sodium is an adverse cardiovascular risk. Uh, a high sodium diet has an adverse cardiovascular risk, both on the kidneys, on the heart, and show data that are a little bit different than the paper that you're alluding to. So I think overall, a low to moderate sodium diet is probably healthier than a really high sodium diet for most people. Therefore, in a nutshell, what we should be targeting, 120 over 80 or by Le Less than 130 over 80. Okay. Well, you got the punchline. Thank Thanks. you very much, yeah. Fantastic.